So, hello, um, my name is Sally Taylor and I've come here this afternoon, um, University of Oxford, to talk about um, an applied project with a problem. So, we're seeking to develop um, meaningful classification of Neolithic Landale axes and link these classifications through to landscape um, in the hope that we then come to understand more how the axes were made and also the mystery of the distribution process. Um, the project is at a very early stage um, and so today I'm going to focus on methodology and try to evaluate really what can, if anything, the quantifiable approach contribute to this research problem. So here we see um, an illustration of the artefacts concerned, um, and I'm showing you here some of the well-known, large, polished examples. Um, and interestingly, very recent dating evidence shows that um, the period for production now is understood to be between 4000 and 3500 BC in the United Kingdom, which is both earlier than previously thought, and also a shorter time span. But we also see um, in the data set many, many examples that have much more variability in size and shape. Um, and I've shown you all of the examples here, all shown to the same scale. And you can see that there are quite a significant differences in the morphology and the size of the artifacts themselves. So a little bit of background. Um, the raw material for the axes originates in Cumbria, in northwest England, in the United Kingdom, and the sources cluster around the Langdale Pikes. There's a, there's a valley, Great Langdale, um, and there's one particular um, peak where most of the um, material is quarried from. And also near to the source areas, we also see a great many flaked examples. And again, I think I would hope you'd be able to see that within this data set of flaked examples, there is also great variability in both <coughs> the shapes and the sizes of the artifacts. And here you see um, what is rather an old map now, a dated map, uh, showing the widespread distribution across the British Isles. And the axes are found in some very interesting places that relate to the Neolithic of the United Kingdom. Um, you can't see the patterns of variability within this because of the, the format of the map. Um, but it's interesting really for us to be able to break this down now. That's what we're trying to do, break down the different formats of the axes in terms of their shape and size and understand why. Because it's now understood that within the south of England here, there are some examples in quite securely dated context that show that they're appearing hundreds of kilometres away from the source area within a very short time span, probably about 100 years. So the production sequence, with apologies to Marie for my French pronunciation, the Chanel Pretoire for Neolithic Polish axes, as is traditionally understood. Um, First, you'll see the primary rough out that's taken from the quarried blocks. It's shaped by secondary flaking and then goes through to grinding and polishing where you will see the final artifact. And this Chenapretoire is borne out by the distribution patterns for the flaked examples because part of the research that I've been doing has used GIS to map the flaked examples, and it seems to be at the moment that the, these examples are all found within close proximity of the source areas. But we have a very limited data set, and so there's an ongoing project at the moment to bring forward axes that are in private collections um, and to see what that can, how that can inform the project. So we've already uh, recorded 48 new examples, increased the data set to 129, but we think it's probably going to be 100 by Easter. And already we can see that there is greater variability in the uh, data that we're getting than in the known examples. 
So here, just have a look at that for you. And I'm, again, here I'm going to talk about the flaked examples because they're the, for the shape and the Chana Poutois, they are of great interest at the moment. So here we see the ones I refer to, the primary flaked examples. And again, all the examples I'm going to show you are all going to be to the same scale. These types of artefacts, these types of axes all generally are found quite close to the quarry sites. We then see the more refined version by secondary flaking. Um, and these are this evidence of secondary flaking floors all around the mountains descending from the quarry sites down into the lowlands. Although there are quite a number of the secondary ones that, that look as if they're not of a suitable morphology that will take on the final form. And particularly the ones with this interesting S curve that you can see in profile on the top. But we also have some very large and quite honestly exquisitely flaked examples that are found again within the area of the sources, but they are found in the lowlands and very particularly placed in, 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 in um, limestone areas. And bear in mind that the material that's being worked here is not flint, it's volcanic tuff. And so the crafts, the, the, the sense of craft that's shown here in um, creating these is, 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 is absolutely stupendous. And then we have other forms that are emerging, which are quite, quite different. They're very heavy, they're thick, they're very round in profile. And so clearly to be able to understand the production of these artifacts and relate them to the geographical area, we need a more refined classification so that we can link them to the location and perhaps begin to unpick the production process. So there have been previous um, exercises to classify using multivariate analysis and here's one that was done in 1996 using 25 variables. Now these are mostly measurements, mostly metrics taken from the uh, artefacts themselves with a very limited focus on shape. So I think there's only one variable which is the angle of the, uh, of the blade which takes account of that. And it was a data set of 800 plus axes. And by K-means clustering analysis, seven clusters were identified. Um, and you can see that they do show some variability in shape by which to classify, because these drawn examples that were given as part of the study are the sort of idealised standard shape that comes from each of the clusters. And if you compare them with the artefacts themselves, I think you can see some similarities and some parallels. But I think we can go further because certainly the examples don't seem to capture the, the true variability of either the shape that we're finding in the data set or most definitely of the size. So there's also an ongoing project of VAX classification by shape, uh, which is led by the Implement Petrology Group in the United Kingdom. And here, the, the approach has been to define a wide variation of morphologies for different parts of each axe. So, for example, here you can see the different shapes that we would look for in the face and the blade section. And we just basically take the artifact and compare it to the shape and make a note of which code comes nearest to the um, by observation. So we also have the blade edge. We also have the profile, the cross section, the butt end and the section. And it's all done by observation matching. But it's really, really difficult to use. Um, and basically, once you've began to hold one thing in your head and bring all these different variables together, it, it basically is it's not really workable without some sort of quantifiable approach. So we need a better and more usable quantified solution to the shape problem as well. So that is what we are trying to achieve. <clears throat> so looking at classification that embraces both shape and metrical data, it identified basically a three-stage process, which several of the presentations already today have gone through and done a similar approach. So first of all, to capture and prepare the shape data. 
And it's really important that this is done accurately um, and precisely and consistently. And then to use the data to reveal clusters by statistical analysis. And as more axes come forward in the data set, ideally we'll continue to test and refine the categorization. And I kind of realized that here I'm straying into an area which might cause some disquiet with some of the um, people attending this conference because basically I'm an archaeologist looking for tools to help with these processes, but we'll keep an eye on the archaeological problem all the time. So, in looking at the capture and preparation of the shape data, um, it's, going to, it's been taken with both polished examples and flaked examples using photographs, high resolution photographs, and also scanned laser images for both types of the uh, polished and rough outs. And currently looking at two packages off the shelf to see how this data can be fed into them and what kind of results. And one is using Prism and MATLAB, and the other one is a package called Geomorph, which is an R package. So here's an example of how Pruitt captures the shape data. It works very well in 2D, and it can pick up surface ridges very, very well, even when they're quite subtle. And you can see that that would be very interesting for particularly the finely flaked examples when we're looking to do a count of flake removals on a surface. It's also quite easy to integrate shape and metrical data together due to the structure of the data set that's held in MATLAB and in the, the array approach. And also it has a very sta simple standardised standardization approach. Okay. The other package is Geomorph which was designed um, in the field of evolutionary biology. And it has a strong focus on morphology in both two dimensions and three dimensions. So it's able to capture quite subtle changes between shapes using both ed edge recognition, the snakes, and also surface landmarks across the um, artifact. And oh, using the landmarks, it uses, um, you designate which landmarks you want to use, and it can use these to both scale and align the shapes, which is really, really important to, to be able to truly compare the difference in shape. You've got to be working to the same standardization. And again, produces data in a format that's suitable for multivariate analysis. So moving on for the data capture to the analysis, this plot, it's just an illustration of the sort of thing that we hope to be able to move towards using the data where you're showing from the standardised shapes and the metrical data where things group and how they relate back to the axes themselves. Um, I'm also going to look at trees as well because I think the trees will be very, very interesting to inform the Chenot Patois because it is a linear process and we'll see how things fit within that. Um, the principal components drawn from the combined data encompasses shape, size and also weight. And MATLAB approach offers us a good range of analyses as you'd expect and so does Geomorph. But that also adds in some quite interesting extra analyses, particularly the option to test shape covariance against single metrical data values and I think that will be useful given the huge size range in weight and size that would be something that would be um, of particular interest. This is a list of the initial set of variables being explored and for now keeping it to 10 um, during development and what I want to do is add in others as the, me as the methodology is refined. And these are based on what appear to be the most significant variables using traditional observational classification methods. But we do really, really want to avoid exclusion of data, and that's why the extra variables will be added in. Um, and it may be that quantified classification may reveal some surprises once those extra, uh, extra data sets are added in. So the next steps. 
um, identify the principal, com principal components, tease out the significance of shape and size variables. Because when, when artifacts are, are classified by eye, the human eyes tend to draw towards certain things that are most obvious. But this is an attempt to kind of say, within a quantifiable numeric measurement, what are the true significant variables that ought to be taken account of when you're classifying Neolithic axes? And see how many groups, how many clusters actually emerge. Because I think I can see four, for example, with inflate examples. But that has to be tested back against the data itself. And compare this qualitative classification with, with, with the um, traditional subjective observational classification. Um, particularly interested in testing how valid the traditional linear process of um, production is and whether that just stack up with using the actual morphologies because we would be able to look at the shapes and say can that shape actually emerge from that shape and can that shape emerge from that shape and it will be a quantifiable measure. And this is year two of a six year project um, and so I would hope to be able to report back to a future CAA on developments but in the meantime I would genuinely welcome any input to help development and I've heard some very, very interesting presentations here already on other forms of software that have been developed that can do a similar sort of exercise. So thank you very much for listening and uh, hope you enjoyed it.